Chapter One of Child of the Cavern. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Underground City by Jules Verne. Chapter One. Contradictory Letters. To Mr. F. R. Starr, Engineer, Thirty Cannon Gate, Edinburgh. If Mr. James Starr will come tomorrow to the Aberfoyle Coal Mines, Dochart Pit. Yarrow shaft, a communication of an interesting nature will be made to him. Mr. James Starr will be awaited for the whole day at the Colander Station by Harry Ford, son of the old overman Simon Ford. He is requested to keep this invitation secret. Such was the letter which James Starr received by the first poke on the third of December, the letter bearing the Aberfoyle postmark, County of Stirling, Scotland. The engineer's curiosity was excited to the highest pitch. It never occurred to him to doubt whether this letter might not be a hoax. For many years he had known Simon Ford, one of the former foremen of the Aberfoyle mines, of which he, James Starr, had for twenty years been the manager, or, as he would have been termed in English coal mines, the viewer. James Starr was a strongly constituted man, on whom his fifty-five years weighed no more heavily than if it had been forty. He belonged to an old Edinburgh family, and was one of its most distinguished members. His labors did credit to the body of engineers who were gradually devouring the carboniferous subsoil of the United Kingdom, as much at Cardiff and Newcastle as in the southern counties of Scotland. However, it was more particularly in the depths of the mysterious mines of Aberfoyle, which border on the Aloha mines and occupy part of the county of Stirling, but the name of Starr had acquired the greatest renown. There, the greater part of his existence had been passed. Besides this, James Starr belonged to the Scottish Antiquarian Society, of which he had been made president. He was also included amongst the most active members of the Royal Institution, and the Edinburgh Review frequently published clever articles signed by him. He was, in fact, one of those practical men to who is due the prosperity of England. He held a high rank in the old capital of Scotland, which, not only from a physical but also from a moral point of view, well deserves the name of the Northern Athens. We know that the English have given to their vast extent of coal mines a very significant name. They very justly call them the Black Indies, and these Indies have contributed perhaps even more than the Eastern Indies to swell the surprising wealth of the United Kingdom. At this period, the limit of time assigned by professional men for the exhaustion of coal mines was far distant, and there was no dread of scarcity. There were still extensive mines to be worked in the two Americas. The manufactories, appropriated to so many different uses, locomotives, steamers, gas works, etc., were not likely to fail for want of the mineral fuel. But the consumption had so increased during the last few years that certain beds had been exhausted, even to their smallest veins. Now deserted, these mines perforated the ground with their useless shafts and forsaken galleries. This was exactly the case of the pits of Aberfoyle. Ten years before, the last buddy had raised the last ton of coal from this colliery. The underground working stock, traction engines, trucks which run on rails along the galleries, subterranean tramways, frames to support the shaft, pipes, in short, all that constituted the machinery of a mine had been brought up from its depths. The exhausted mine was like the body of a huge, fantastically shaped mastodon, from which all the organs of life have been taken, and only the skeleton remains. Nothing was left but long wood ladders down the yarrow shaft, the only one which gave access to the lower galleries of the Dochart pit. Above ground, the sheds, formerly sheltering the outside works, still marked the spot where the shaft of that pit had been sunk. It being now abandoned, as were the other pits, of which the whole constituted the mines of Aberfoyle. It was a sad day when for the last time the workmen quitted the mine in which they had lived for so many years. The engineer, James Starr, had collected the hundreds of workmen which composed the active and courageous population of the mine. Overmen, brakemen, putters, wastemen, barrelmen, masons, smiths, carpenters, outside and inside laborers, women, children, and old men all were collected in the great yard of the Dochart pit, formerly heaped with coal from the mine. Many of those families had existed for generations in the mine of old Aberfoyle. They were now driven to seek the means of sustenance elsewhere, and they waited sadly to bid farewell to the engineer. 
James Starr stood upright at the door of the vast shed in which he had for so many years superintended the powerful machines of the shaft. Simon Ford, the foreman of the Dochart pit, then fifty-five years of age, and other managers and overseers surrounded him. James Starr took off his hat. The miners, cap in hand, kept a profound silence. This farewell scene was of a touching character, not wanting in grandeur. "'My friends,' said the engineer, "'the time has come for us to separate.' The Aberfoyle mines, which for so many years have united us in a common work, are now exhausted. All our resources have not led to the discovery of a new vein, and the last block of coal has just been extracted from the Dotrick pit. And in confirmation of his words, James Starr pointed to a lump of coal which had been kept at the bottom of the basket. This piece of coal, my friends, resumed James Starr, is like the last drop of blood which has flowed through the veins of the mine. We shall keep it as the first fragment of coal is kept, which was extracted a hundred and fifty years ago from the bearings of Aberfoyle. Between these two pieces, how many generations of workmen have succeeded each other in our pits? Now it is over. The last words which your engineer will address to you are a farewell. You have lived in this mine, which your hands have emptied. The work has been hard, but not without profit for you. Our great family must disperse, and it is not probable that the future will ever again unite the scattered members. But do not forget that we have lived together for a long time, and that it will be the duty of the miners of Aberfoyle to help each other. Your old masters will not forget you either. When men have worked together, they must never be stranger to each other again. We shall keep our eye on you, and wherever you go, our recommendations shall follow you. Farewell then, my friends, and may heaven go with you. So saying, James Starr rung the horny band of the oldest miner, whose eyes were dim with tears, then the overmen of the different pits came forward to shake hands with him, whilst the miners waved their caps, shouting, Farewell, James Starr, our master and our friend. This farewell would leave a lasting remembrance in all these honest hearts. Slowly and sadly, the population quitted the yard. The last black soil of the roads leading to the Dochart pit resounded for the last time to the tread of miners' feet, and silence succeeded to the bustling life which had till then filled the Aberfoyle mines. One man alone remained by James Starr. This was the overman, Simon Ford. Near him stood a boy, about fifteen years of age, who for some years already had been employed down below. James Starr and Simon Ford knew and esteemed each other well. "'Good-bye, Simon,' said the engineer. "'Good-bye, Mr. Starr,' replied the overman. "'Let me add, till we meet again.' "'Yes, till we meet again, Ford,' answered James Starr. "'You know that I shall always be glad to see you and talk over old times. "'I know that, Mr. Starr.' my house is in edinburgh always open to you it's a long way off is edinburgh answered the man shaking his head i a long way from the dochart pit a long way simon where do you mean to live even here mr starr we're not going to leave the mine our good old nurse just because her milk is dried up my wife my boy and myself we mean to remain faithful to her good-bye then simon replied the engineer whose voice in spite of himself betrayed some emotion no i tell you it's till we meet again mr starr and not just good-bye returned the foreman mark my words aberfoyle will see you again the engineer did not try to dispel the man's illusion he patted harry's head again wrung the father's hand and left the mine all this had taken place ten years ago but notwithstanding the wish which the foreman had expressed to see him again during that time starr had heard nothing of him it was after ten years of separation that he got this letter from Simon Ford, requesting him to take, without delay, the road to the old Aberfoyle colliery. A communication of an interesting nature, what could it be? Dotrick Pit, Yarrow Shaft. What recollections of the past these names brought back to him? Yes, that was a fine time, that of work, of struggle, the best part of the engineer's life. Starr re-read his letter. He pondered over it in all its bearings. He much regretted that just a line more had not been added by Ford. He wished he had not been so laconic. Was it possible the old foreman had discovered some new vein? No, Starr remembered with what minute care the mines had been explored before the definite cessation of the works. He had himself proceeded to the lowest soundings without finding the least trace in the soil, burrowed in every direction. They had even attempted to find coal under strata, which are usually below it such as the devonian red sandstone but without result james starr had therefore abandoned the mine with the absolute conviction that it did not contain another bit of coal 
no he repeated no how is it possible that anything which could have escaped my researches should be revealed to those of simon ford however the old overman must well know that such a discovery would be the one thing in the world to interest me and this invitation which i must keep secret to repair to the dochart pit james starr always came back to that on the other hand the engineer knew ford to be a clever miner peculiarly endowed with the instinct of his trade he had not seen him since the time when the aberfoyle colliery was abandoned and did not know either what he was doing or where he was living with his wife and his son all that he now knew was that a rendezvous had been appointed him at the yarrow shaft and that harry simon ford's son was to wait for him during the whole of the next day at the calendar station i shall go i shall go said star his excitement increasing as the time drew near our worthy engineer belonged to that class of men whose brain is always on the boil like a kettle on a hot fire in some of these brain kettles the ideas bubble over in some they just simmer quietly now on this day james star's ideas were boiling fast but suddenly an unexpected incident occurred there was the drop of cold water which in a moment was to condense all the vapors of the brain about six in the evening by the third post star's servant brought him a second letter this letter was enclosed in a coarse envelope and evidently directed by a hand unaccustomed to the use of a pen james star tore it open it contained only a scrap of paper yellowed by time and apparently torn out of an old copy-book on this paper was written a single sentence thus worded it is useless for the engineer james star to trouble himself simon ford's letter being now without object no signature End of chapter 1